Welcome to Embargo, a podcast featuring intelligent talk about sanctions, export controls, and all things international trade for trade nerds and normal human beings alike. I am one of your hosts, Brian Fleming. I'm here, as always, with my intrepid colleague, friend, and co-host, Mr. Tim O'Toole, live from our offices in downtown D.C. What's up, Tim? Live from just above Black Lives Matter Plaza in downtown Washington, D.C., for the first time in a long time, really. Yes. And as I was just talking off mic, I was planning to be in the office as well today, but was thwarted by a nail in my tire this morning. So did not drive into the office. I am at home as usual. Uh, But uh, in all events, happy to be here on this sunny, uh, cool autumn afternoon in mid-October. Thank you for joining us as always. Thanks to everybody who reached out after the last episode. Um, as always, we have, you know, it's odd. We were sitting down to plan this one a couple days ago and we're like, ah, not much has happened in the last couple of weeks. And then like in the last three or four days, there's been about seven different things that have happened. So we're going to devote a, quite a bit of time to those, to those things, many of which are sort of closely related to one another, actually. Uh, that's going to be kind of the bulk of the show today. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, as, as always, you, the more, um, the more you were lulled into a false sense of security, the more um, uh, your uh, the the sanctions gods will come in and catch you by surprise if you um, if you get too uh, get too comfortable. Um, so before we get started, of course, the normal warnings that um, we're not giving legal advice, we're not sharing confidential information. Everything you hear today. Uh, is the view and opinion of myself or Mr. O'Toole. If you disagree, blame us. Uh, if you like the pod, please subscribe. You can find us anywhere you get your pod content. Uh, spread the word. We will be back uh, in a couple weeks. We're kind of back to our normal schedule now every two weeks. Uh, next one will probably be up uh, first week of November. This will be up hopefully later this week, um, kind of mid to late October. Um, so, Without uh, further delay, let me run down what we're going to cover today because it is, as I said, a bit more extensive than we maybe had even planned when we were originally getting ready to do the episode. So number one, we're going to start with the announcement yesterday of the results of the Treasury sanctions review that has been undergo that has uh, been underway since the early days of the Biden administration, just announced yesterday. Uh, some testimony given by the Dep- Deputy Secretary today on the Hill on on that report as well. Um, we'll start there as that I think is a, a useful framing device uh, for us to think about many of the other things we're going to talk about today. Um, number two, we're going to cover the new OFAC guidance for the virtual currency industry that was just released late last week. Um, we're going to pivot from there to DOJ enforcement um, priorities and announcements. One that is directly related that it relates to the um, the cryptocurrency uh, task force that was just announced a couple weeks ago, um, and one a more broad based statement on DOJ priorities in the sanctions and export space. Um, then we're going to pivot. We're going to stay with DOJ, and we're going to talk about ZTE and its monitor, its forever monitor. Um, and whether or not they're ever going to get out from under their monitorship. Uh, very interesting Wall Street Journal article on that topic last week for anybody who hasn't um, who hasn't read that, and featuring quotes from a couple of my former colleagues uh, at DOJ. And then um, we're going to end with our final topic, a big a big topic, China and Taiwan, uh, and checking in with what is happening. Uh, there and what the implications of that could be for U.S. foreign policy and in particular U.S. trade policy. And then in the lightning round, we're going to cover two topics. We're going to cover the extradition of Alex Saab, um, who was just uh, extradited to the U.S. from Cape Verde yesterday, and implications for Venezuela and the Maduro regime that are already being seen there. And then the final topic, our our favorite, uh, JCPOA 2.0, and whether or not it is time to... um, play the requiem for JCPOA 2.0, given what we're seeing uh, lately on um, the possibility of more talks. So that's the show. We have a lot to cover. Um, A lot of, again, closely interrelated topics, especially those first three. But um, before we get started, Tim, any, any big thoughts before we jump in here? Lots to talk about, but I think it is all interrelated, so I think we're going to get through it quickly. I think this is going to be another very crisp episode of Embargoed. 
Um, the more we tell ourselves that, the more likely it is to happen. So no, um, that's, that's the mantra us. that we that's the mantra we repeat into the mirror every morning in case anybody's exactly. worried, uh, or before, or at least on episode recording days. So, um, all right. So without uh, any further hold up, let's jump in. So topic number one, as I mentioned, is the um, results of the Treasury sanctions review that was just announced yesterday. And I think we touched on this when it was first discussed uh, and floated very early on. Um, Secretary Yellen and Deputy Secretary Adeyemo had spoken publicly about this and, and the work that was underway. Uh, by Treasury in connection with interagency partners to sort of look at, in essence, the role of the sanctions tool as a U.S. foreign policy mechanism uh, and to think through how it is that uh, the U.S. should be using this tool, whether it is being done effectively, whether it is being done, um, whether it's being overused, uh, how it should be calibrated uh, in the sort of broad scheme of things from a U.S. foreign policy perspective. So this was just announced, and I will say, to I'm going to read off uh, to, to sort of situate everybody who may, maybe hasn't seen this, I'm going to read off kind of the, the high-level bullet points of the kind of five key takeaways from the policy review. Um, but before I do that, I will say, everything that I'm about to say should come as no surprise to anybody who's been paying attention to what's been going on for the past nine months. This is in many ways, I think, and to Tim and Tim and I, really just a summary of everything that we have seen and that we have expected to see from the Biden administration with respect to how they were going to utilize sanctions, especially OFAC administered sanctions. Um, and so, again, everything that we're about to say n should not come as any great shock. Nevertheless, it is still significant that this is now sort of out in the world and is now the U.S. is on record right. that this is the way we are going to be administering this this tool uh, or these this collection of tools known as sanctions um, going forward, at least under the current administration. This could obviously all be undone and changed uh, under a new president. But for now, this is the this is the course that has been charted. So let me read you quickly the high level um, takeaways, the bullets. So number one, um, Adoption of a structured policy framework that links sanction to a, sanctions to a clear policy objective. Another way of saying that is we are not going to just deploy these willy-nilly to show our distaste for certain actors and actions that are being taken abroad. And we have talked about this a lot, obviously, because the Trump approach was polar opposite of this. And this is has been essentially adopted since day one of the Biden administration, this has been the approach essentially. And, and this is now sort of formalized to some degree some, that this will be the approach. Uh, some adult is going to ask, presumably, what's the goal here, which never seemed to really be asked in, in, in previously, or at least not as often as it should be. Is the tool being deployed for a specific purpose? What is the likelihood that it will achieve said purpose? Etc. That is essentially what this boils down to. Number yeah. two, multilateral coordination wherever possible. Also read as we will coordinate with our allies as we deploy sanctions. Again, this is one we've talked about a lot. It is a, a, a strong departure from the way the Trump administration was doing this, although it is largely bringing back in line the way that the U.S. has deployed this historically. Um, and and it, actually, later in the episode, we're going to talk when we get to Taiwan about exactly this topic, because I think this is an important one when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, but multilateralism reigns again. Again, not surprising. We've talked about this a lot. That is that is sort of front and center. Um, calibration of sanctions to mitigate unintended economic, political, and humanitarian impact. We talked about this a lot about this recently with Afghanistan and whether or not there was going to be any action taken directed at further action taken directed at the Taliban. And we, we, um, surmise that it would likely be very, very tailored, whatever action was taken, because there was a, uh, a high priority on not causing secondary and tertiary consequences that were going to be, that were going to exacerbate the humanitarian crisis that is already ongoing in, in Afghanistan. And again, this statement, I think, supports that. We have plenty of data points, whether it's Iran, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, other places where that are heavily sanctioned, where there has been evidence, ample evidence in recent years that 
uh, perhaps too punitive a sanctions policy, too broad-based a sanctions policy is just tremendously detrimental to the to the per- people on the ground, the the citizens of that particular country who are the sort of innocent bystanders in this that are not aligned with or even supportive of the ruling regime. That is now sort of firmly in place as a as a front and center priority of how the sanctions tools will be used. Um, number and then number four, ensuring sanctions are easily understood, enforceable, and where possible, reversible. We know this all too well, obviously, that sanctions can be somewhat inscrutable to many. Um, see easy, Cuba. <laughs> see the Cuba regime. <laughs> um, see some aspects of the Iran regime, the Iran sanctions, and and other aspects between the mishmash of can you know statutes, executive orders, regs, and everything, and, and guidance that OFAC issues. Uh, it can be just a, a really impenetrable mishmash of authorities and guidance and very difficult to follow even for sophisticated actors. So this sort of says we're, you know, we're going to tr- do our best to make this, um, you know, a usable framework that people can understand and follow. And then finally, um, number five, investment in modernizing treasury sanctions, technology, workforce and infrastructure, um, building technological capabilities deepening institutional knowledge, especially relating to digital assets and um, and related services. We're going to get to that in a minute when we talk about virtual currency and, and uh, ransomware and the like. So those are the five big, t- big takeaways. There was, a, there was a separate document that was also issued that sort of gets into this in more detail. We encourage everybody to take a look at that. Um, and then, as I said, uh, Deputy Secretary Adiemo was, uh, text, was um, uh, testifying today on the Hill uh, sort of on the back of this report being released. So let me pause there and throw it to you, Tim. What are your sort of key takeaways from this now having summarized this? Is this a big deal? Is it not a big deal? What do we what do we take away from this? So, so I mean, first off, I, I totally agree with you that this is OFAC kind of committing to writing what they've really been doing for the past six months and what seemed to be their overall attitude towards U.S. sanctions. Um, that said, I, I, I thought there were really three big um, you know, news stories out of this that even though they were written down, kind of seeing them written down made me think, wow, that that is kind of an interesting recognition coming from o- OFAC. I mean, the first is that overuse of U.S. sanctions are actually undermining their efficacy, and particularly uh, the recognition that there are, that, that the world is at least in part turning away from the dollar because of the 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 overuse of sanctions i mean i, I we've seen that in our in our day jobs and so we know that that really <laughs> is happening yeah, but but to see treasury recognize that and recognize that as kind of a limit on the use of the sanctions power was was I, I think important, and I, I I I'll see if they I'll be interested to see if they follow through on that. But I I think it is important. I I think the second big takeaway I have from this is the the recognition that um, sanctions can have unintended consequences when it comes to humanitarian aid. Now that is not nothing new. We've talked about it all the time, and we're not the only ones, obviously, who are talking about it. That is, once you put a country under sanctions, even if you carve out a humanitarian exception, it, it's very hard to actually make that a useful exception. And so the people in the country do get injured because you interfere with humanitarian trade, even if you say that's not what you're trying to do. Treasury recognizes that. Now, it, th- this was a this was kind of a big themes type document. There were there weren't a lot of kind of calls to particular action, and so I think that w- is one where the devil will be in the details, because it's always been U.S. policy not to interfere with humanitarian aid, but you the U.S. has now recognized that despite that policy, it is interfering with humanitarian aid. How do you change that? And one way is to use sanctions a lot less, but it wasn't like this report was accompanied by the repeal of you know certain sanctions programs, and then you know the 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 final takeaway was this kind of focus on multilateralism which we've you know seen which is not unique to sanctions in terms of being a, a Biden administration priority but again you know will the devil will be in the details cuz you know i i i kind of interrupted you when you were summarizing to 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 note that um you know some sanctions programs seem to to live forever without any real particular goal and cuba is just a great example of that cuz cuba flunks all of their tests, right? I mean, the goal seems to be to overthrow Castro, who's dead. 
Um, the 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 fact is is that nobody around the world except the U.S. Uh, supports the Cuba embargo, and it does interfere with humanitarian aid, whether we like it or not. I mean, we are interfering with hu- Cuba humanitarian aid. You know, so does the government. And this is not to say you know the Cuban government is a, a, a is a worthy cause or is doing anything to support its own people. I mean, that that is separate and aside, and that's really the trick, right? Is that on the one hand, when you say ratchet down the sanctions and and repeal the embargo, some people view that as support for a really, you know, by all accounts, odious regime. And it's not. It's just kind of recognizing the limits of sanctions policy. And so the, 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 it's easy for us who are not kind of facing an electorate to to say this doesn't make any sense and it, it flunks all of their tests. But with the administration that also has political consequence or political considerations to take into account and and does have to to answer to to the voters are they willing to take the potential heat of following through on these principles even when in many instances um they might be removing sanctions on regimes that you know nobody wants to support they're just doing it because the sanctions themselves Aren't being aren't being useful or having unintended consequences um, seem to go on without end because there's no goal in sight and you know get our allies angry like that's a good reason to remove them but it the 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 message will always be there that you have relaxed the pressure on on some sort of awful regime and thereby supported that regime so I think it's complicated but I I think they're right on the the big principles whether they can follow through on them in the abstract is the the real question so I think the one thing that is worth bearing in mind to use the Cuba example is that there's going to be a fundamental difference between how these, let's call them philosophical pillars of sanctions deployment for the U S government are, are going to be used on a brand new going forward. This is a new challenge, new issue, new party, new rogue actor that we want to deal with versus someone like Cuba, which is obviously the, essentially the oldest, most, uh, you know, well-established program that we have in the U.S. And I have a hard time believing that there is going to be, as you said, just kind of a, a, a relaxation because there's now a realization that perhaps the program is not fit for purpose because if that purpose is regime change, that is not happening and hasn't happened for decades and decades and decades. If the purpose is something slightly different than that, which is we don't want to be funding a you know a, a regime that is engages in all kinds of reprehensible conduct um some of which has direct consequences felt in the United States then that's a little different perhaps that does give you room to recalibrate a little bit but i think for something like cuba it's going to be difficult although so I, but i would say that as you said with the on the humanitarian aid side to my mind the idea that taking a more tailored approach and a more thoughtful kind of strategic, how are we connecting the dots here between what we're doing and what we're hoping to achieve is clearly what has been happening for the past nine months since the new treasury team has been on board and the new direction coming from the Biden administration. Um, and then how that get, how that continues to play out going forward, you know, it'll be interesting to see. But I will say for people like us who are oftentimes trying to um, think through either just on our own or for the benefit of clients sort of what are the potential, what could be coming? What, what, how will this be perceived or how will certain, um, things look three months from now or six months from now or a year from now? I think this is a helpful lens to view some of those things through because if we, and if they stay true to what they're setting out in this document, then it at least gives you, a, again, a little bit of a strategic and philosophical grounding for what we should expect to be seeing on the Treasury side of things and on the OFAC side of things when it comes to administering these programs, r- rolling out designations, providing guidance, uh, uh, providing general licenses, et cetera, right? That, that, and those are massively consequential things across many of these programs. And so I do think that as a as a sort of organizing principle and a framing device for how this is all going to work going forward, this is useful to have now as a, as a written document. Again, you know, if, if, if there's a administration change and 
2024 into early 2025, they could literally set fire to this thing and it would just go away and we could revert back to Trump era approach here or something different. But for, for the foreseeable future, at least this, this seems to be the way. And now it's, it's sort of charted out in a nice kind of orderly way in this document. The, the one thing that I would add, I mean, is when they are touting the successes of sanctions policy over the last 20 years, I mean, the first success story that they list was the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, right. And I, I tend to agree with that, right? I mean, it meets all of the tests, right? They had a they had a reason for imposing sanctions on the Iranian regime beyond just the, we don't like them. It, they wanted to stop the nuclear program. They imposed sanctions on the nuclear program. The sanctions were multilateral. Um, the, the, they, they were reversible because they were reversed in the JCPOA as an incentive for changing the behavior that they were trying to change. And so it met all of those tests. They tout as a success story, but the fact of the matter is, as we'll talk about later, I mean, now it's in tatters. And, and so all of these things are, are all, all of these principles, although they kind of sound high minded, are very disputed. And, and there's a big segment of the United States that strongly disagrees with this view of sanctions. Yeah, it is a very fragile balance to strike here, for sure. And I just do not think and we talk about this all the time that this is, at the end of the day, a terribly black or white area. There's a lot of gray and a lot of nuance and how it gets used and how it gets enforced is really a matter of a lot of discretion, subjectivity and policy judgment at the end of the day. And that's part of what makes this such a fascinating area and part of what makes it such a confounding, frustrating area <laughs> to many. So, you know, that that is, I don't think going to change and I don't think that we're going to be out of a job by virtue of the fact that there's, you know, this, these new, as you say, kind of pillars, high minded principles to kind of guide the way the U.S. is going to be deploying this. So with that, why don't we put that aside for the moment? We will certainly be referencing that today and I'm sure into the future as we talk through some of these issues. And then let me quickly pivot to um, item number two, which is the new um, guidance that OFAC issued for the virtual currency industry last week. And so obviously in the last episode, we talked about the ransomware guidance. This is kind of a close uh, sister, brother, cousin to that guidance, quite frankly, targeted specifically at the virtual currency industry. Um, it, it's clear that this is something that was in the works for a very long time as well, just like the ransomware guidance was, I believe. Um, for anybody who hasn't downloaded the actual um, guidance document, I have to tip my cap to the good folks at OFAC and their um, art department because they have a kind of an, a funky sort of teal and sort of the color scheme is a little, if you're an NBA fan, it's a little mid nineties Charlotte Hornets kind of reminiscent or early Florida Marlins kind of. I, I, I had to tell going you, on. Brian, when I saw that um, color scheme and the, and the, the layout, I, I, I came to suspect that a person that, that I know at OFAC may have been involved in that because I've worked with, him or her on other presentations like that. And that seems to be a particular favorite of theirs. Just a wild guess, but I... Perhaps. I, that I person was, shall remain nameless. But exactly. anyway, we, we could, we, again, seriously, tip of the cap. It's a little, it was it's good. A little, snaz, it's a little good. snazzier than the typical OFAC uh, advisory document or, or yeah. guidance document. So this is really, at the end of the day, um, so this, again, is kind of a follow-on part of a broader narrative and a broader effort that's going on, obviously, in the space. Um, we're going to talk the, the first topic we're going to talk about with DOJ is directly related to the national cryptocurrency enforcement team that has just been announced, obviously, right in, in lockstep with this as well. These are all things that are being kind of coordinated behind the scenes within the interagency. I think the most um, important takeaway that I have from this is so the guidance document for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um, fully encourage you to download that um, the, the document is sort of a. I have to say the first half of the guidance document is actually just a really good sort of primer on OFAC, on U.S. sanctions, on how all the different types of sanctions work. For anybody who is less familiar with this or even just anybody, even for more sophisticated people who need to put training modules together at companies or, or for whomever, I would really encourage you to look at this. It's a, it's a nice sort of encapsulation of sort of what the OFAC uh, administered sanctions really are is the first half of the document. And the second half is really best practices for the virtual currency industry that are that are um, really run through the prism of the framework, the OFAC compliance framework, the sort of tone at the top, 
internal controls, um, testing and monitoring, and and every the sort of the pillars that have been now out in in publicly available for everybody for now a couple of years. So that's really what the document is. Again, I would say, to my mind, this is a useful um, sort of marketing awareness raising campaign. Again, targeted at the virtual currency industry. For those who are asleep at the wheel that are in the virtual that are part of the virtual currency industry, the drumbeat go, grows louder that there is more there is more attention being paid by regulators and enforcers. You better be paying attention to these types of things. If you're not, you will have to pay the piper eventually. I think on this, there are going to be more enforcement actions coming from not just from OFAC but from DOJ as well as we're going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. Um, and so, and building on the designation of SUEX, the first, um, you know, sort of virtual currency exchange that was just sanctioned a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is kind of, we're entering a bit of a new era, I think here with this industry and, and in these, um, and in the enforcement prioritization of this, uh, type of actor. And so, yeah, to me, that's really what this is all about. And, and again, I encourage everybody, anybody who hasn't looked at it, whether you're involved in virtual currency industry or even have any brushes with the virtual currency, currency industry, I would still encourage you to take a look at the guidance document. It, it's a useful, um, it's a useful tool, I think, for anybody who has uh, any need to be thinking about and aware of what OFAC is currently kind of focused on and aware of and what the priorities are and yeah, so so really that those are my sort of big takeaways from it. I, I don't I don't see too much. Also some some I would also say there was also a FinCEN report that was released in con in connection with this at the same time, and there are some astounding stats in there about the level of su suspicious activity reports that are being um, submitted on ransomware attacks and um, and the amount of money that is changing hands in connection with ransomware attacks, the numbers are, have really gone just through the roof in the, in 2021. And so again, th this is, people may be getting tired of hearing this, but this is just not, this is not something that is going away. This is going to be a focus and a priority for OFAC and others within the government for the foreseeable future and, you know, get used to it and really, I think, wrap your arms around it if you haven't already. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to wrap items one and two here, I think, because I think they're completely related to each other. Agreed. I mean, I, so so I, I, I think the, you know, the OFAC announcement, which was had really nice bells and whistles and I thought was was geared towards the public and not really geared toward sanctions nerds, which is important because I, I think that this is part of a big push by OFAC to focus on um, the use of cryptocurrency. I think it's probably prompted by the fact that there it, there have been all these ransomware attacks that have been so high profile and that they have been kind of deemed to be one of the priorities in terms of enforcement of the administration. And so I think they're wrapped together on this. I thought that the, the FinCEN um, advisory was very interesting, just the stats and, and, and all the different ways that they looked at it and it's clear that treasury it's as a whole is focused on crypto focus on crypto use in ransomware but not just its use in ransomware and so you know it's not surprising that around the same time doj and and uh deputy attorney general monaco announced the creation of a national cryptocurrency enforcement uh, team, you know, back on, uh, on on October 6th. And at around the same time, John Carlin announced, you know, a, a DOJ white collar enforcement uh, initiative, one uh, aspect of which was that they're going to start focusing more on sanctions and export control cases, although it's really white collar cases as a whole that they talked about focusing on. I, I will say, you know, the one piece of it that that the one piece of the, the white collar announcement that was a little bit surprising to me was this inclusion of export and sanctions, because because I, I would say from the last administration, there there was at least I perceived a drop off in white collar crime enforcement generally but not with respect to sanctions and export controls. I, I really didn't, I, I thought, you know, per, particularly when it came to North Korea, um, Iran, Syria, uh, you know, and even potentially Cuba, there were some Cuba cases that came out of the last administration that 
there was that 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 focus has been relatively consistent, but they did include it within kind of the they're creating teams, they're marshaling resources, and they're going to start going after um, enforcement in in that area. I think it's related to the crypto ransomware push, but I I think it's certainly broader than that, and and um, but all of a piece because I think you've got all kind of levers of the government really focusing on not only sanctions but crypto sanctions related to to crypto um and and uh ransomware attacks and the involvement of cryptocurrency and ransomware attacks and other types of criminal behavior right so a couple of uh, i'll just respond to a couple of things you said there and then we can move on but so number one i agree completely that the the on the ofac side this is really meant to be targeted at the public and we've talked about this now a few different times in recent months the idea that and in the fact that this was well publicized, that in some of these big ransomware attacks, ransoms were in fact paid. They were paid via virtual currency, uh, whether it's Bitcoin or something else. Um, there is clearly now a push to try to get companies and other actors to think twice before doing that. Uh, clearly, you are putting yourself oh, yeah. at risk. You're putting your own. There is no doubt about that. So it is it is a think twice, three times, four times before you hit send on the instruction to transmit that to whatever anonymous uh, wallet is provided to you to pay a ransom. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think with the um, the Lisa Monaco uh, announcement of the NCET, as it has been called, the National Cryptocurrency Enforcement Team, um, and the related John Carlin, who is the who is her deputy in the in the Deputy Attorney General's office, he's the number two there. Um, they are, I think, clearly, I, I will say, these these efforts do not get stood up at DOJ unless there is an expectation of some results. And in particular, in the speech that uh, John Carlin gave, he quoted the fact that there were 150 open export and sanctions criminal cases right now, that 70% of those relate to Iran, China, North Korea, and Russia. Not surprising to hear that that's the distribution, but interesting that they would go public with that. I don't know that that's something that gets talked about all that often. Um, agree with Tim completely that we did not see a it sort of a noticeable drop off on the on the on the criminal side with export and sanctions cases, often because, and I, we've talked about this before. These are long gestating cases most of the time. They take a while to investigate. They kind of move along. You know, whether it's six months, a year, 18 months, two months or more that you need to investigate these cases properly and get them charged and and perhaps, um, you know, make arrests or at least seek arrests in those cases. So they take a long time. But this is clearly a message that we are surging resources. We are, as he said, we're doubling efforts to try to bring more of these cases uh, successfully and to use this as a, a really kind of important tool in the toolkit to deter these types of actors. Uh, and again, I think that kind of goes, that goes across from the NCET the sanctions and export. It's all kind of of a piece. And then there's another big initiative that was announced with respect to an FBI squad being resident within the fraud section at DOJ that kind of goes along with this as well. This is all part of the, um, the effort that's under underway now. And I do think there, there has been, at least anecdotally, and to some degree, I've seen hard number, hard data on this, the idea that the Trump administration had kind of taken their foot off the gas when it came to kind of corporate and white collar cr criminal enforcement. Obviously, they designated hundreds and hundreds of different actors over at OFAC because, again, some of those principles that are now um, sort of memorialized in the new Treasury policy were the counter was was true. It's just like let's designate as many people as we can, and let's you know we're gonna that's how we're gonna exert pressure, and that's how we're gonna show our displeasure for certain actors uh, without necessarily and and it was maximum pressure without much sort of you know vector uh, correction or thought about how much this is really achieving any particular purpose. This is now I think uh, you know just making a very cut and dry that there is has been a full tack back in the other direction especially in our areas of focus to really try to hold actors accountable um, and uh, to put a lot of resources behind that to have I and we're going to talk in a moment about ZTE and the ZTE forever monitorship and whether that's actually going to go away or whether we're going to see what that 
foretells for other actors that could be in the crosshairs Huawei in the future uh, with respect to resolving criminal cases with DOJ. And so, uh, you know, it is a big shift. I think we see these types of shifts, obviously administration to administration, but this is, this is a real kind of stake in the ground moment, I think for this new administration at justice and what we're, what we're going to see. And so I think that's, that's just a, you know, not a warning shot, but just a, you know, something to be, and I've had this discussion with clients, you know, if there's, if there's interest in certain transactions and certain actors and certain other activities that your company may be involved in, if you get a subpoena from a U.S. attorney's office that might be, you know, looking into certain activities relating to these topics, you need to now think through it, I think, in a slightly different way than maybe you would have two years ago. I I do think that is true. And I think that that's, that's something to bear in mind. I completely agree, and I, I, you know, I, I did say that that the activity in in our sphere of the white collar um, practice has been relatively consistent. The one country that I would say is not that that's not true with is Russia. Is Russia? And and you know, Russia was not an enforcement target for the Trump administration, at least as best I could tell in this area. Um, there weren't a lot of sanctions penalties imposed. Uh, there were some designations, as you pointed out, Brian. But but even with the designations, those often tended to to either go away or not really result in a lot of enforcement activity. Um, and so you know, given the announcements about a week ago, it's probably no surprise that today the FBI raided that a house owned by Oleg Deripaska in Washington um, as part of an investigation that's apparently going on in the Southern District of New York. So, so you know, they're, they're, they're already, you're already seeing signs of this enforcement increase in the sanctions realm, particularly as it relates to Russia. Right. Um, so with that, let's, I think that's a good, I think that's a good pivot to maybe tack, tack over to another uh, to China, tack back to China for a second. We're going to hit two China topics in a row. Um, and that is, uh, for anybody who has not seen it, I would highly recommend you check out the article that ran in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago relating to the apparent disagreement about whether or not ZTE's court-appointed monitor is going to be extended. Uh, for those who have not been, this is, I will say in fairness, just a a total mess <laughs> and, and has been almost from the beginning. And, and I, again, I, I was, I'm not speaking from any of my inside knowledge at DOJ. I'm only talking about what's being reported in the press. Um, but to, to track you back, there was a guilty plea entered and a monitor appointed in 2017. That was supposed to be for a three-year term that got, not only did that term get extended by two extra years through to 2022, which is now what the dispute is, is whether it's going to be extended again beyond that now five-year term. There was obviously the separate issue that the Commerce Department raised about the inaccurate, the misleading and inaccurate statements that they were getting from ZTE on a variety of things that were under their purview. They instituted, imposed another fine, instituted a whole separate, it's not technically a monitor, but it's essentially a compliance um, an outside compliance uh, team that is in place now at ZTE to keep tabs on what is happening there on behalf of the Commerce Department. This is, of course, totally separate from the court-appointed monitor that was put in place uh, via the DOJ resolution back in 2017. And there are, again, I would encourage everybody to read the article in the Wall Street Journal. I don't want to spend too much time talking about some of the more um, salacious details that are in here. Um, namely the fact that the monitor, uh, James Stanton, I think is widely regarded as having had no business being the monitor in the first place because he had no relevant experience. He was he a personal close, injury lawyer. He had close ties to the judge who appointed him. Um, there have been ethical and other con- concerns that have been voiced by many over time. Those persist, and those are perhaps the loudest they've ever been now if you read this article. Um, I think, and never, and nevertheless... He is insisting, apparently, as reported, that his term needs to be extended. Never mind, he is reaping millions and millions and millions of dollars of benefit every year that he remains as the monitor. Um, And also, by the way, it's also being reported that, and this has been widely reported, that ZT is also under investigation for other conduct that has nothing to do with the export violations that they were originally placed under the monitorship for and that they were originally placed on the entity list for. And those relate to, I believe it's visa fraud and uh, FCPA violations potentially. Yep. Um, and apparently, as reported, he is insistent that he should be investigating those things as well, which 
if I've if if that is the case, that would be pretty astounding given the scope of what his original remit was under the terms of that agreement that were signed in 2017, or that the terms of the um, that the monitor. And of course, the judge also has kept everything under seal in this case, um, making it almost impossible to really get at the truth of what is in fact being authorized, what his bills are for his monitorship services. There's a lot of smoke and potentially fire in that regard. And it sounds like the company's not happy. DOJ is not happy. Other observers are not happy. Again, two of my former colleagues commented on this, one of whom called this whole situation a train wreck. Um, I will let you all determine for yourselves whether you agree with that when you read the article. Um, but I want to talk about, and Tim can weigh in on this himself. He's got, I, I, I'm not going to let it go. I, I, his, I'm not his reality, go, TV, so. his reality TV, this is, years are, are, are sort of are grinding right now. And he made wants, for Bravo. He wants this to, he wants to chime Bravo. in how there's going to be a real housewives of, um, Shenzhen that's made to feature what's going on with the ZT monitorship situation. But I put that aside for one minute because what I, I will let Tim do that, obviously, but I'm also going to tee up the separate question, which is really, I think at the end of the day, the bigger, more consequential question, which is, and this is teased out in the Wall Street Journal article, what is the impact of this going to be in the event that DOJ wants to try to resolve the case against Huawei? And is this going to mean that Huawei is not going to have a monitor as a result of this mess? And, I would submit that the answer may very well be yes, that they are not going to that they are going to potentially be able to wriggle free of a monitor um, of a monitorship if they are going to resolve as a result of the the fact that this has not turned out I think as everybody had hoped or planned at the outset with respect to getting ZT back on the straight and narrow and having this kind of cleanly administered to have clean lines of sight and oversight into what it is that they're doing and and to clean up the initial kind of root cause of what was was the issue, which is dealings with Iran, lying to US authorities and others about this, et cetera. So that's what I want to put that's what I want to put on on the burner for you to consider. But before you do that, obviously please feel free to freestyle on any of the other I, uh, sort I, I wanna... of I want to get the purple, that purple glossy, around. the purple glossy version of this discussion. I mean, first of all, um, there's just three things about this Wall Street Journal article that I can't let go of. I mean, the first is that apparently the judge wrote a book, and Mr. Stanton, the the monitor, described the judge as his mentor in a in the dedication of a book he wrote. Now, it's the the article isn't clear who wrote the book, and, and but but the fact that that they're they're already on record as this mentor mentee relationship before the the kind of out of the blue appointment of this person as a monitor was was a nice little detail and and good reporting to kudos to the to the reporters on that and second you you can't just uh, truncate David Lofman's quote because it is one of the best quotes of all time. Feel free so to Dave, give it full airtime. I'm going to give it full airtime. I mean, so he's described as the, the former Justice Department official who oversaw ZTE's plea agreement. And he described th- what is going on now. And and remember, the, the, the monitor who was appointed out of the blue has already been extended once and is basically now, according to the article, trying to jam ZTE into agreeing to a second extension. And apparently when it said no, it he, he set which out by, a list which, of by the all way, the people he was going to depose and all the things he was going to do to the right. company that he was monitoring. He, he set everybody on a, on a fire. There were like 10 fire drills that, yes. were, that were set off as a result of that. By the way, according to the article, DOJ is – not in disagreement with the company that the end yes. of the, that this should be the end at, in 2022 that that should be the end of the term of the monitor yes so D- david's quote is this train wreck is a long time coming while it was entirely appropriate for zte to submit to a rigorous monitorship it's also essential that the process for appointing monitors be above ret- above reproach and that monitorships are conducted in a responsible manner with appropriate oversight and accountability that's a pretty damning quote. And and then it's followed by the statement that the Justice Department didn't immediately respond to a request for comment because nobody went on the record. Say? Yeah, what's nobody went on say? the record on this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but my favorite, I have to say my favorite um, part of this is when the judge's chambers was asked for a comment on why they did particular things. Their response was because in connection with this, because. 
That's transparent so, justice for you right there. We did it because. Why is yeah. it under seal? Because. Yeah. So so um this is a train wreck and and it always because has we don't been, want anybody because we don't anybody want anybody to understand how much money is being made off of this monitorship. Right. Which, by I mean, the way, it's got, is typically something that is is knowable. Um, yes. You know, and, and and should be. Um and 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 that's not to to I mean there are plenty of monitorships that work well and and look you know you know it, it, the work of a monitor can be very very taxing especially when it's a multinational corporation where you've actually got to try and figure out what they're doing in different jurisdictions so it can be pretty expensive but but this just seems to 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 go beyond the pale on that but but i i will say a couple of things with respect to the huawei question because um you know one thing about cte that i we may have commented on at the time i i think we've commented on it at, at, at some point in in the podcast so there's another monitor for cte and and i think the reason that the commerce department still has a monitor that's in place and i think the reason that the commerce department monitor went into place is because there was a realization back um you know several years ago that that the the the, the way that this monitor ship was set up and and the the capabilities of the monitor who was appointed by um, his friend the judge uh, were 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 not up to the task and so the commerce department appointed a separate monitor and that and I think that that tells me that that the concept of monitors has not been given up on um, it's just that uh, the way this monitor ship went down uh, created issues. Now that's not to say that all monitor ships are appropriate and all monitor ships are great and that they don't have problems. But I think this this one may say may actually make them more cautious with respect to Huawei and a monitor. But but I, it might be a caution in the process as to how the monitor is appointed as opposed to the concept of a monitor. Yeah, generally. I think that's a I think that's a fair point. And and to Tim's point as well, we know very well we have colleagues who have served as DOJ appointed court appointed monitors uh, when done right it can be a really incredibly valuable tool a win-win for the government and the company quite frankly if, if done correctly I think all evidence here is that this has not gone according to plan or as as hoped at the outset I think to your point Tim that is an interesting kind of flip side to the insight uh, or the thought that perhaps this will make it harder to get a monitor in place with Huawei if that's what DOJ seeks uh, perhaps though, may, maybe not, maybe, maybe you're right. right. Maybe there are some lessons learned here about how it gets structured, how the, app, how this, how the, um, appointment process would work. Um, it would not be done in, in Texas in any event in this district. So we, there would be no, uh, issue with the same judge having any <laughs> impact on that. It would be in Brooklyn or, uh, in all likelihood. So, uh, that is very different, I think, and could very well be um, is still in play, I think, in, in light of what we talked about last time with the resolution with the CFO, uh, with Ms. Meng, uh, and the admissions that she made and wh what they're positioning for. What the end game is there with Huawei, it's still unclear, but it could very well be that that is the end game. Uh, I would say, um, you know, that It'll be interesting. To, obviously, Huawei has sort of handled things very differently than ZTE. ZTE was placed on the entity list first, and then immediately began cooperating to try to get off the entity list, and then to tr and then as a as a byproduct of that, resolve this this the criminal case against them. Um, that is very different than Huawei, who has been fighting tooth and nail at every step, and has been resistant to any suggestion that the U.S. is in has any right to be. Uh, weighing in, judging, or criticizing anything that they've done. So it, it is a very different posture. It's it's kind of in a very different place, and they've taken a very different approach. So who knows where that will ultimately land at the end of the day. But it will be fascinating to see because that is clearly the closest kind of, you know, analog i think in, in that we know about obviously there could be others but the, uh, certainly the closest analog huawei is a bigger company any kind of resolution that would be reached with huawei would be a bigger deal at the end of the day would have bigger impact i mean if you look at what has happened to zte by virtue of this resolution the entity listing that went into has been on and off a couple of times in the last few years the commerce resolution the commerce you know oversight that's happening now it is really it has diminished them certainly in the U.S. and and perhaps even globally if you look at the numbers. Uh, Huawei, it's still hard to say. Although some evidence suggests that they have 
they have had similar uh, struggles as a result of the entity listing and, and the criminal cases in the U.S., but time will tell sort of where the criminal cases go for Huawei and what the what the what the end game is there. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I I think that while the way Huawei um, responded to uh, enforcement actions was informed by what happened to ZTE, for better or for worse. And I think that Huawei saw that when ZTE cooperated, things went south, and and this monitorship was was a real problem there's a and, lot of reasons for that to be clear <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Not, no no no. it's not just no, no. the monitor's fault there's a lot of reasons that oh i i agree i agree ZTE, but I, I i think the message you know and I, i'm not saying that it's the right message but i think right. one of the messages is that, that huawei took out of watching the zte enforcement action was you know it, it, if you if you cooperate if you eventually cooperate anyway because that ZTE did not immediately cooperate, but cooperation is not a viable strategy. I, I think that while we learned that learned that lesson, and again, I, I'm not saying that it's the right lesson, but I think it's certainly the one that that Huawei took it away from. Before we leave this topic, I do want to want to want to you know go back to this uh, quote because I want to make make sure that I get it right. But but um, the courtroom deputy for the judge who appointed the monitor was asked to provide redacted copies of the monitor's report and was asked why he was refusing and that was what he said because to so we we don't know why these are not being provided other than because right and to be clear for those who are unfamiliar in the u.s legal system the presumption is for openness and transparency and things are only kept under seal and out of view of the public in exceptional circumstances and we don't even know why technically they are being kept under seal at the moment uh other than you know, the cynical view would be that nobody wants to see how much money the monitor is making and uh, and and all of the, you know, demands that are being made, which, you know, if, if held up in the light of other similarly situated monitors, one would probably have to question what is and is not sort of reasonable and appropriate and whether right. the this is being done in a in sort of a properly uh, at the proper scale and scope and depth that it needs to be. Right. I mean, in in our system, transparency is the norm, and you don't need to give a reason. If it's right. if it's transparent, you can just say because. But when it's when you're sealing stuff from the public, and particularly documents that like this, where there would seem to be a public interest, you're supposed to give a narrow, compelling reason for why the documents are being kept from the public. So correct. So that's when you're not allowed to say just because. I, we will definitely be coming back to this one at some point. It may be a few months before there's any uh, outcome here or we see where this shakes out. But um, and, and also I would add final thought before we p- move to the last uh, topic of the day. Um, obviously difficult for the, the Biden era DOJ to sort of back away from or be seen as like, pro ZTE. That is a tough pro China pro ZTE. That is yep. a tough dynamic, a tough, they're a little bit between a rock and a hard place there. I do not envy my uh, friends and former colleagues who are involved in this. It is not uh, an easy place to be to try to find a way through this to kind of thread the needle to strike that right balance, but not be seen as being sort of soft on ZTE or China more broadly, uh, or um, you know, sort of validating of any of the any of the very concerning things that they have unquestionably done in the past. So it is. It, it's a really fraught situation, very difficult, and could have big implications beyond this. So we will keep a close watch on this one. Speaking of fraught situations, yes. Um, let's go to Taiwan. Let's go to Taiwan. Um, so uh, you know, this is not a really a, a sanctions or export controls topic, but it could quickly become yeah. one. So yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> Basically, in Taiwan right now, there is uh, a, a dangerous game that is is going on where, um, you know, the U.S. and its allies. So you you mentioned this in the intro, Brian. I mean, this is a multilateral effort to support Taiwan on the one hand, um, because Taiwan is, in China's view, is is a province of China that is it has a separate government, but it's all part of the same country. That is, it's not contra- does not contradict the U.S. view, but the U.S. Uh, I think uh, 
treats Taiwan as more of an independent province than perhaps China would uh, agree to, not perhaps, but def definitely than China would agree to. And some of our allies, including the UK, including Canada, in including Australia, um, and including Japan, uh, support that view. And so what's happening right now is you have a a buildup of the Chinese Navy, and I, I was reading some of the articles about this and kind of astonished at how quickly China has gone from kind of a very uh, minor Navy that really did not rival that of a, or did, did not resemble that of a superpower to really the second biggest Navy in the world, and in many ways, the biggest Navy in, 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 by, by some measures. And, and much of that buildup has been uh, out of the desire to flex its muscles with respect to Taiwan. And so you have this situation where the U.S. continues to have, you know, some presence in Taiwan where, you know, in a very narrow strait between the island of Taiwan and, China, the, you know, the, the, the east coast of China, you have, uh, you know, U.S., Canadian, uh, Australian, Japanese warships sailing through the Strait of Taiwan, um, which ant antagonizes the Chinese, obviously. And at the same time, you've got China doing flyovers of Ch Taiwan and, and building up its naval presence in that region. Um, this seems like a situation that is is not going to end well. And I think the one one thing that I would add to that before kind of throwing it over to you, Brian, is um, you know there's also a road a recent roadmap for this sort of situation in Hong Kong. Um, you know Hong Kong's set status is a little bit different than Taiwan's status since the Ch Chinese negotiated that status and they actually have a treaty with the British that formalizes the status of of Hong Kong. Although you know that status seems very different today. With Taiwan, I mean, the status of Taiwan is a relic of the the civil war in China, you know, back in the 1940s when the Communist Chinese Party took over chi uh, China and the nationalist uh, Taiwanese or what what was then the Chinese government kind of fled to Taiwan and set up shop there and have created essentially a, a separate government um, and and for quite a long time have acted like a separate country. And so, you know, you have this situation where uh, China wants a one China policy, considers Taiwan to be part of China the same way they considered Hong Kong to be part of China, um, and uh, has acted on that very recently to, to really uh, clamp down on the autonomy of Hong Kong. Uh, it, it is a little bit ominous as to what's going on in Taiwan with that as a backdrop. Right. We see, uh, I think, the Hong Kong parallels are somewhat striking, although this is in some ways different, but close enough. And in a, a recent example where we have seen things obviously deteriorate in terms of uh, the way that the U.S. has recognized Hong Kong and, and the way that China has uh, sort of co-opted Hong Kong to some degree with the national security laws and, and other actions that they've taken. And, and the the resulting measures that the U.S. has taken, whether it be on the sanctions front, on the export controls front, or, or what have you. So to me, the most interesting thing here from, obviously, there's a lot going on in the background. There's there's the threat of military engagement. There's other things going on that we're, that are a little bit outside of the purview of what we cover on, on the pod here, but I think are, are all informing, perhaps, the way that the U.S. is trying to formulate policy here to some degree. Um, revelations that came up recently about U.S. having some military personnel that had been in Taiwan, sort of conducting training and advising in Taiwan for the last, uh, you know, several months, last year, et cetera, um, inflaming the situation to some degree uh, in the eyes of the of, of the Chinese government. So, um, my to me, the interesting question is, again, in light of what we just talked about at the top of the show about new sort of you know, philosophical underpinning of our approach to sanctions is multilateralism. There is clearly at the moment, at least multilateral support for the U.S. with respect to the way it's trying to support Taiwan and push back against China. And that includes a lot of different countries. That's uh, that's close allies like the U.K., Australia, New Zealand, but also Canada, but also India, Japan to some degree as well, uh, that have been sort of part of these um, military exercises or other things that have been going on in the region, at least, uh, that have some connection to the situation in Taiwan. So to me, the interesting question is, if the U.S. were to decide or were to float the idea of 
of exercising some kind of sanctions authority targeting China with respect to Taiwan. We're trying to uh, impose, you know, we've seen entity list uh entity listings targeting the South China Sea and activities in the South China Sea. Could we see something that would be similar here, that would be similar uh, under whether it would be, I don't know what authority it would be. Could it be Magnitsky Act? Could it be something else? Congress could potentially act on its own here too to arm OFAC and the and state and others with, uh, with the power to, to take steps here. I wouldn't be, that's we saw that with Hong Kong. We could see that here, theoretically, to the extent that Congress can agree on anything these days. It can agree on China. That's really it. <laughs> so uh, we could see that. I, I think there's a lot of fascinating directions it could go. I don't really have a clear sense of what's going to happen. But bear in mind, at least from the on the OFAC side of things, we are going to, and on the White House side of things, we are going to see, I think, this filtered through the, the, what we talked about at the top on the, the Treasury sanctions policy and sanctions review, I do think this will be one of the first fascinating tests of how that plays out in real in real time under that new kind of philosophical umbrella. Again, putting aside what Congress may do and what that may enable uh, President Biden and Treasury to do as a result, but it's it's really it could go in any number of directions. Um, many of them not really not good, <laughs> decidedly not good. Um, but it will, it, it's one to keep an eye on when I think we will probably be steering back toward. And part of the reason we wanted to include it is we haven't really talked too much about Taiwan. We talked during the Trump to Biden transition about a few activities that were happening with respect to Taiwan and how that was, um, potentially going to play out and be perceived by China and what that would mean under the new administration. But, I think it's time to put China back in view. I mean, to put Taiwan back in view with respect to China and with respect to our sanctions policy and our foreign policy more broadly, obviously, um, and and to just keep that on everybody's radar because th there could be a lot that happens here in the coming six to twelve months. A lot happening in Taiwan. I mean, it really yeah. is. It's worth watching. Yeah. So with that, that's our final sort of full topic of the day, and we will now pause for the lightning rest round side effect and we're going to hit two topics in the lightning round side effect so topic number one uh venezuela we are going to really shift gears here for a second to talk about something we have not hit on at all today which is venezuela and specifically the uh announcement yesterday that um alex Saab, as he is known uh a colombian citizen who was closely aligned with the maduro regime he is sometimes referred to as a a, a Maduro financial fixer or a Maduro um, uh, financier was uh, extradited to the U.S. to the Southern District of Florida um, on charges relating to uh, money laundering and FCPA in connection with violations of the FCPA um, to, in a scheme to uh, pay bribes to take advantage of the Venezuelan government's um, favorable exchange rates. And so... Um, that in and of itself, you may say, well, what does that have to do with sanctions? What does that have to do with what I hear you two talk about all the time? That's important for the following reasons, in my view. So what happened immediately in the aftermath of this <laughs> is that, first of all, for those who were not aware of this, so um, Mr. Saab was put on the SDN list about two years ago, a little over two years ago, right around, I think on the same day he was indicted uh, on these charges. He was arrested about a year ago in Cape Verde. Um, no sanctions related charges, which as we talked about before, you cannot extradite on sanctions related charges basically anywhere because they're seen as political crimes uh, and you're never going to get extradition. So good old fashioned money laundering and FC and fraud that that'll fly in most places that we have um, extradition treaties with. And so that is, in fact, what he was extradited on. And. Um, the Maduro regime, in the since the time he was arrested, had put up a, quite a fight to try to portray him as a political prisoner, and that this was he should have diplomatic immunity and a variety of other arguments uh, in an, in an effort to not distance themselves from him, but sort of really go all in on trying to put pressure on Cape Verde to um, prevent him from being extradited. Well, that didn't work. He's now been extradited to the United States, and it, immediately upon the announcement that he was being extradited. Um, the Venezuelans arrested, or some may say kidnapped, six uh, oil executives that are in country in Venezuela who had pre previously been under house arrest there. Um, 
this is perhaps another example of sort of hostage diplomacy that we talked about with Ms. Meng and what China did with the two Michaels and Can the two Canadian citizens that they were holding in some um, this may be another example of that. We talked about that a little bit the other day, but it is clear that the Maduro regime is not happy about the fact that Mr. Saab is now in U.S. custody and that he is now going to be facing charges in Southern District of Florida and in all likelihood is going to be leaned on pretty heavily to start cooperating and perhaps to avoid a big jail, jail sentence uh, in, in, in the course of doing that. And the other piece that goes along with this is that there had been some early stage talks in Venezuela with the U.S. backed opposition party and the Maduro regime to talk about having and holding free and fair elections, something we've talked about a lot on the pod, which is clearly the ultimate end game of the United States with respect to Venezuela. And those talks are now done for the, at least for the time being in light of Mr. Saab's uh, extradition. So with that, I will throw to you, Tim, to, to weigh in on what you think the impact of this will be and you know, with respect to U.S. Venezuela uh, policy and perhaps beyond. Well, I mean, I think it. I think it's important. Although I think you know how it how it plays out it will depend a lot on on private conversations that are probably currently ongoing between uh, Mr. Mr. Saab and his lawyers and, and the DOJ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but I think that um, you know the one the one piece of the 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 sob story that i wanted to to comment on is that the talks that were going on in in mexico and and those talks i think were were critical to the us sanctions program in venezuela because i think the biden program or the biden administration unlike the trump administration um is is really likely trying to bargain away the sanctions in exchange for free and fair elections. I think the Trump administration was trying to bargain away the sanctions too, but they were trying to bargain away the sanctions sanctions in exchange for Maduro's overthrow. And I think, as we've talked about many times, regime, getting a, changes. regime change is just really hard to effectuate through sanctions policy because, because no government is going to negotiate itself away. And so the, you might get them to negotiate in, themselves into an election, particularly one where you know they think they can win, but you you, you aren't going to be able to get them to negotiate themselves out of power. And so so I think that that those talks were really very linked up to the sanctions in Venezuela. I think they probably were done under some sort of US, you know, certainly blessing. Um, and and the U.S. was very interested in those talks, and so it'll be interesting to see whether Maduro walks away from those talks for good, or whether there's a suspension in those talks. I, I agree that the hostage di diplomacy here is also worth keeping an eye on because it is very similar, or it seems very similar to what happened in China after the the attempted extradition of Mrs. May. And what we've seen in the past in Iran and other places as well, uh, agree completely. So yeah, and again, just hearkening back to, again, where we opened with just sort of the new philosophical underpinnings of US sanctions policy, at least as administered by Treasury and OFAC, the idea that there, there are sort of clearly articulated goals and whatever is be, being sought has got sort of a, uh, you know, a defined purpose and end game in place. I think what Tim said is exactly right. The idea of working toward free and fair elections, clearly the end game here for the US and now, at least for the time being, that is going to be put on hold and we'll have to see where it goes from here. So uh, it's something to keep an eye on uh, in, uh, in Venezuela. And then with that, let's move quickly to our final topic, one of our favorite topics, which is JCPOA 2.0 and whether or not we may need to start referring to it as JCPOA 0, 0. <laughs> right. perhaps. Right. RIP, I think, yeah. is probably where it's headed. I, like, it's very hard to tell. I, I, I mean, you know, I think you pointed out on the last podcast that, you know, if the new Iranian regime wanted to end this process, it, it, it could easily do it by walking away, and it hasn't walked away, which is at least some evidence that they don't intend to end this process. But boy, um, they're coming very close. Uh, so, so they, you know, there, there are no talks currently going on in Vienna. It appears that the that that President Raisi and and his, um, you know, and and the the government officials that he's charged with. Uh, pursuing this this line of negotiations have now gone to the EU and tried to essentially take their case to the EU outside of the Vienna process not with much success at least to to read the news articles about it uh, it is kind of a weird tack to 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 try and go outside the process that said i mean today 
Um, you know, Secretary of State Blinken met with the head of the IAEA. They did discuss Iran according to the readouts from the meeting. And so so there is something happening there. But, but boy, um, as the clock ticks, and we've said this a lot, it gets less and less likely because the the um, the benefits to the U.S. of a deal are less, and it, it, because the the end date of the the you know the temporary solution that was the the nuclear agreement gets closer to being over, and so it gets really hard to jump back into the deal. And if it, the com the complexity there is that then you say, well, why don't they just negotiate a new end date? Well, if you negotiate a new end date, everything goes on the table, I think, from the Iran side, because Iran is going to say, if I'm going to extend this, what are you going to give me? And then you have a whole new negotiation and you really can't. I, I think that's going to be untenable. Right. Not to mention the fact that this is widely perceived as being just a stall tactic by the new regime in Iran to be able to continue to enrich uranium <laughs> over right. the course of a number of months without proper IAEA oversight. And I think that was the point that Secretary Blinken and the director general of the IAEA made in their joint comments uh, today um, or yesterday relating to that and trying to keep the pressure on Iran to say, look, we are ready to resume indirect talks in Vienna. You're the ones that are stalling um, this sort of offshoot talks that are being discussed with the EU officials in Brussels or something else is, it just seems like a, a sort of frock and detour here and, and something that's not going to be ultimately very, uh, very productive. So I think the bottom line is uh, if you were to ask us at any point over the last six plus months, what our, scale of one to 10, where we thought we were in terms of likelihood of a deal being reached on JCPOA 2.0, I think we would have been not, not at the far end of, you know, it's a certainty, but I think probably five or slightly above for the most part. I think I'm probably below that now. I think I am now skeptical that there is going to be a deal as time has worn on. And sooner or later, one side or the other is just going to completely Walk. I mean, look, you can say completely walk away and then that could prompt action by the other side if they say, oh, wow, maybe we pushed too far. But um, I do think that there is getting we're getting close to a walk away point one way or the other. And uh, I, I now have personally sort of dimmer views that there's going to be a deal uh, and a resuscitation potentially of the sanctions relief that had been negotiated originally. Yeah, I mean, that's basically where I am. I, I still keep in the back of my head the idea that the Iranians are still calculating economic figures with the sanctions lifted and, and and showing that their economy would get a huge boost if the sanctions were lifted. Right. And they really do have strong economic reasons to, to want the sanctions to be lifted. Um, but every day that passes, I get more pessimistic about that, that, right. that ever getting to an agreement. I agree with that. So in any event, we've, we've had a lot of discussions over the last couple months since Raisi came into office about <laughs> what was maybe happening about to happen still basically nothing has happened the last few months right? but it nothing. is it is significant it is of such a significance that I think we do keep coming back to it time and again we keep getting asked about it uh out, out again in our in our day job so I think it is something that we're obviously still watching closely everybody should keep an eye on but for now nothing new to report and that is likely uh, not good for the prospects of resuscitating any kind of a deal uh, going forward. So with that, I think that wraps us for today. That's the end of the lightning round, the end of the episode. Uh, we covered a lot of ground actually in just a little over an hour. Uh, and um, yeah, any, any sort of final thoughts before we, before we part for the day, Tim? Covered a lot of ground. Um, and, and I'll be interested to see how this new, this new kind of statement of, principles or mission statement from OFAC plays out in the real world. Yeah, it will be interesting to see uh, as the rubber meets the road and as we have perhaps more tangible data points to support some of these pillars or these findings that came out of the review, uh, what that is in fact going to look like and how that is going to work in practice. We will obviously be keeping close watch on that and we'll be sharing our thoughts, I'm sure, as, as things evolve over time. So with that, uh, thanks everybody as always for joining us. Uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks, uh, in early November. Um, and in the meantime, hope everybody stays safe, stays healthy, stays sanctions free and go Rex Red Sox. Stay sanctions free everybody. Thanks. Bye everybody. Bye.